I'm going to try a bit of um, uh, surgery, stitching a balloon. I'll keep trying, although I don't think it's possible. I was thinking about um, and preparing this talk, even though you think I might not have prepared it. And um, suitcases, and I was looking up some facts. Suitcases have been around since the time of the Egyptians to carry things around. And um, wheels have been around for thousands of years. But it was only in the 1970s that Bernard Sandow decided to put suitcases and wheels together. Imagine that. Man went and walked on the moon before we had wheels and suitcases. Was he a genius? No. He just saw a problem thought around it, and came up with a solution. He was frustrated by a problem. And some people think that you have to be a genius to invent something, or uh, you have to be a special type of person, but I don't believe that. I think we are, we are all creative, and we are all innovative. But it's beaten out of us. How did this surgeon, working with this scientist in this institution, earn over the last 15 years over one billion pounds. One billion pounds. Because he had a simple idea. Wasn't very clever. Wasn't a new paradigm. It was an extension of what was already being performed. In fact, there was a surgeon in Kansas doing the exact same thing, so they brought him out. And there was a surgeon in, uh, in um, Russia who was also doing the same thing 20 years before. who applied for a patent on the same idea, and it was turned down on the basis that in the 1800s, someone had already described a similar device. Anyone know what the device is? The VAC. So they patented the idea, and they licensed it to a company set up by a ex-military um, doctor, medic, Jim Leininger, who was a respiratory physician, and he set up um, a company that sold air loss beds. So he was kind of involved in the sort of pump market. And they do some research, and they do a lot of pseudo-research, and on the basis that there's no evidence whatsoever that this device works, they sell a lot of this product. So much so that they sell one and a half billion pounds worth every year, of which these guys get their royalties. It really took off once the military took a container load of these devices to the first Iraq war and used them. And they demonstrated that they could reduce the infection rate after a military wound from 90% if they used a vac to the incredible zero percent. That's the paper. That's good results, after which, of course, the takeoff of VAC in the States went through the roof. Who's that author? His son. There's no disclosure. One billion dollars. Who doesn't want a part of that? Who doesn't want to be an innovator? There are lots of other reasons to innovate, of course. You know, <laughs> the patient gets better, you make a name for yourself, you might get a Nobel Prize or some other prizes, uh, you get the respect of your institution, the institution uh, likes it, but nothing motivates you like money. What if there were no innovation? Where would we be? We'd have no operating instruments. We'd have no anesthetics. We'd have no robotic surgery. But there'd be no transplant. There'd be no neural implants. There'd be no um, endoscopic or, or um, uh, laparoscopic surgery. 
there'd be no microsurgery, we'd be in the dark ages. So innovation is an essential component of moving forward. And we're not at the stage that we know everything. We're at peak knowledge, and therefore we no longer need to innovate or know. Some people think we are. <coughs> Surgeons are the top innovators. We are the innovating beasts of the medical jungle. Why? Because every time you operate, you do a little innovation, mainly, particularly in plastics, but in other specialties as well. You modify <laughs> where the incision is. You encounter some anatomical abnormality, and so you then vary your approach. Uh, you run into difficulties, so you have to change things. You may modify based on the outcomes or results you're getting. You choose which stitch you use, and everyone chooses a different stitch based on their personal preference on the sales rep or what they're told to use. Compare that to physicians. You can't see physicians going, well, I'm going to give you half of one of these pills and half of one of those pills, and you know, we're going to mix them up. So they don't get a chance to innovate the way surgeons do, but surgeons are in a unique position where we can innovate on a daily basis, and we do. So if you take a, um, a scheme like this, it's a good continuum, where on the left-hand side, small innovation, tinkering, how big your incision is, where you place it, uh, how you stitch something, how you, how you approach whatever type of operation you do is tinkering, and everybody kind of does that. And on the far right is some sort of innovation or idea that's a complete paradigm shift to everything you ever believed. So I'll go through some examples of mine um, to illustrate this. So this is a young boy with pollen syndrome is missing some ribs. So I'm going to do a lat dorsi flap with rib to reconstruct the, uh, taking a lower rib to reconstruct the deficient upper rib and the lat dorsi to create a pec major. So there's an opportunity here to tinker around because the rib's vascularized based on the latissimus dorsi. I do it through a five centimeter incision and buried deep in the axilla rather than a big long incision, etc. Tinkering. So that's kind of over here. Now there's a big sort of gray area along here. So it's very difficult to define a point at which things are. But changing where your incision is or how long your incision is, well, I think that counts as tinkering. Syndactyly. So there's a great opportunity in congenital hands or congenital anomalies uh, for, from all specialties to innovate because the anatomy and pathology change or are variable for every patient. So you kind of have a standard operation. But syndactyly is one where you can generally um, get close to standardization. And the standard technique was to do a rectangular flap like that, zigzags, and then to um, drop the rectangular flap down and skin graft those triangles that was there. So that's what happens, and there's the skin grafts that are present. Well, what happens if you want to do it without skin grafts? You could sort of plan this in reverse and think, well, look, if that's the rectangular flap there with the skin grafted bit, what happens if we took the flap and the skin grafted bits all as one big flap in the beginning? So there's the rectangular bit, there's the areas of skin graft. But if we took that as a flap, then that would go into the defect, the wings, would close the bits where the skin graft was, and the resulting defect here you could close because you could advance the skin and keep the finger in extension. So here's a case that we've done that to, and there's the patient healed, no skin graft, an acceptable scar, and as you can see, it doesn't change with age. So that's a little bit more than tinkering. That's sort of a modification of an existing technique. Uh, the idea comes about by thinking in reverse, um, so it's probably somewhere along here. Radial dysplasia, another congenital anomaly. The standard of care is to balance the hand and fuse it to the end of the ulna. Well, in every other sort of congenital anomaly, we try to restore anatomy rather than just accept what's there. But that's been the standard of care for decades. It is possible. This is a different innovation. So. Um, the exposure for radial dysplasia is described as using um, two petals of, a, of, a, of skin flap from the dorsum of the wrist. 
So a little bit of tinkering here. In fact, you can do the same flap and exposure from the Palmer side, which gives you much better exposure of the Palmer structures which you want to see tinkering. But here, instead of balancing the wrist on the end of the ulna, we're going to reconstruct the radius using a fibula with the fibula head and the physis. It has to be vascularized to two vessels in order to keep it alive. But that's sort of giving us an anatomical reconstruction. So it's just, in this case, the idea comes about by questioning the accepted um, method of care. Is it good enough? No, it's not good enough. Every time this is debated, our results are terrible. So you have to come up with some new approach, which is, this is possibly one approach. So maybe somewhere over in the middle. Here's a gentleman who presented to me. So this is an idea that came out of a problem. So this guy has had his sternoclavicular joint excised. If you leave the sternoclavicular ligament intact, it's not a problem. If your excision goes too, dis too lateral, then it's a problem. And he's a brickie, wants to return to work, and he can't lift his arm up to build a wall. So you think, how can I solve this problem? Well, I'm really used to taking people's second toes and using it to give them thumbs or to give them other joints. So we can reconstruct this using a second toe joint. That's a second toe metatarsal, the MTP joint, and the proximal phalanx. It moves a bit like a clavicle, slightly restricted in flexion. So you can then stick the proximal phalanx in a hole in the manubrium and screw it in and use the metatarsal as a medial portion of the clavicle. So that forms a clavicle, that forms a sternoclavicular joint, and you screw that in, plate it on, and then um, do your anastomosis. And that um, idea and ability comes from working with orthopedic surgeons, so we know um, how to approach bones and um, with our plastic skills doing toe transfers. And here he is with normal shoulder movement, no pain, and he returns to work building walls. I don't know where that fits on the line. Um, with the intestinal transplant team, um, doing intestinal transplants, this is a, another idea that comes, arises out of um, fixing a problem. And their problem is closing the abdomen after an intestinal transplant is performed. So the technique is to do an abdominal wall transplant, which of which 12 had been done previously in the States, but the idea hadn't really caught on, so we adapted it. The fear was that there was a long delay with the ischemia period before I could revascularize the donor abdominal wall. And so go, going back in time, and so this idea generation comes from looking backwards, people used to do pedicle flaps on arms before they would transfer them around the body. So they'd take a tube of skin and fat from the abdomen, stitch it to the arm until it picked up a blood supply, <sighs> cut it off the abdomen, and then move the hand to wherever they needed that flap of skin. And so this is just a revitalization of an old technique. A little bit more technical, because we're, we're revascularizing it by doing the micro rather than allowing time. And that way you can provide an abdominal wall without, in a patient who has no um, lower abdominal vessels, and can feed off the arm, and then that solves that problem. So it's an innovation response to a problem, and then a second problem arises, and a further innovation, the answer of which can lie in the past. Again, you know, somewhere in the middle. And then ideas that arise out of it, observations and extensions. So from the abdominal wall transplants, we observed that um, you could see the immunological events in the patient in the transplanted skin. So the patient got signs of acute rejection, the transplanted skin developed a rash. And that meant that they could change the way they modified uh, the follow-up of the patient because they could look at the skin rather than having to do scopes to look at the bowel and biopsy them. And so an extension of that was what happens if you don't need an abdominal wall? So we got patients then who had intestinal transplants who had capacious abdomens, didn't need abdominal walls. Well, we could still take a bit of skin from the donor, but we don't need to take abdominal wall because that made them a bit paunchy, and the, but we could take a bit of radial forearm flap and stick it on their forearms. And so we could have the same monitoring ability 
with a small of passion, pattern of skin. And so this is now formed the basis of a research program where we are looking at the utility of these flaps in, in other transplants. I don't know where that fits on the line, but somewhere here. If it proves to be very effective and all transplant patients end up with a sentinel flap, then it will be a paradigm shift in monitoring of transplantation. From my interaction with the intestinal transplant and the transplant team, um, I was gifted this patient who'd previously had an intestinal transplant, then got a squamous cell carcinoma of his, of his parotid, um, sorry, intraoral with a metastasis to his parotid. It was all excised. He was left with a facial nerve palsy. And one of the transplant surgeons, and he said, well, why don't you transplant a cadaveric facial nerve rather than taking his sural? You know, he's already on immunosuppression. Uh, it'll be like a free donor. So we did some cadaveric studies, uh, got some approvals, and in the end, that's what we did. This is sort of like a reverse neck dissection. We did the neck dissection on the, on the donor um, and then put it in on the recipient, reconstructing his facial nerve. I'd love to tell you it was a great success, but a, a year and a half on, he hasn't showed any signs of recovery. Fail. Another congenital hand problem. So this is a hyperplastic thumb with a type 3B where there, is, or where there is no base of the metacarpal and no basal joint. The traditional or the accepted method of treating this is to cut the thumb off and then transpose the index finger into a thumb. But some parents don't want that. So you have to think about possible alternatives. An alternative is to try and reconstruct this by, you could use a second toe uh, metatarsal. Second toes are a good donor site. But here's an even better idea. You can use a split second toe. So instead of taking the whole second toe metatarsal, you split it in half longitudinally. So you leave half of it on the foot with its growth plate. And then you take the other half and put that in the thumb. So this idea came about after I went to a conference, saw some Japanese people had done this in six cases, non-vascarized. And that was how I was going to do it, until my Australian fellow goes, why don't you vascarize it? And of course, that's so obvious. So that's what we did. We vascarized it. And it creates a basal joint, a thumb. You then do tendon transfers. And people end up with a useful thumb, five fingers on the hand. And the second metatarsal miraculously regenerates and grows. It's something for nothing. It's great. So somewhere in the middle again. Here's a difficult problem. Again, the, an innovation that's come out of a problem that's been presented. A patient who's got a non-union of a fractured pole of the scaphoid and the proximal pole is dead. So it will, it will never heal. So the traditional treatments are to cut that out and then either fuse those four bones, gives you a stiff wrist, take out all the proximal row, <coughs> trochoetrum lunate and scaphoid, to get some movement, still a bit stiff, but a shorter wrist, or fuse the whole wrist. But you can cut it out. And so thinking about this problem, um, people have tried to replace these with prostheses, for example, but they, the prostheses tend not to work. You look around the body, is there a bone that looks like a scaphoid? So here's a, that's a scaphoid. Here's a bone that looks like a scaphoid. It's your coracoid. You do some modeling. We have got some CTs of people who had shoulders and hands um, CT'd, and you can model them together, and they look and do matching things, things that are way too um, difficult for me to, to explain. But they do some matching plots and go, oh, they're a pretty good match. Some of them match slightly better than others. But the matching for size of your ipsilateral scaphoid to your ipsilateral cor coracoid is good. We then said, well, can we vascarize a coracoid? And did some cadaveric studies. And the coracoid is supplied by a branch that directly comes off the axillary artery. Not in the books, not described, but it's there in every case. We've done 20 cadavers, and I've done 20 plus cases. 
Um, and every case where I do an infraclavicular expiration, I look for it anyway, and that branch is always there. There's the branch, runs straight off. There's the coracoid, conjoint tendons cut, pec minor tendons being taken off, and the branch runs deep to and underneath the coracoid, supplying it and then passing through to the humeral head. And there's an accompanying vein. And the, and the branch constant, take two, two to three centimeters in length, one to two millimeters in size, perfect. There it is, coracoid divided, nice curve, lateral view, AP view. <coughs> then you can stick it in, screw it, and then the, the vessel comes off the top here and you anastomose it to a dorsal carpal um, artery that's just sitting there and vein. And so you can convert a case like this to one like this. We don't tell the radiolo radiologist what we've done, and so we send them for CT scan and x-rays after three months and go, it's a scaphoid united, to see if anyone will pick up. It's not a scaphoid. It's not been picked up yet. So I don't know where this sits. Because what we have there is a, um, an established technique, being able to do a bone transfer, but we've, we've gone and looked for a, a new bit of bone to, to move. And there's no, there's no shoulder dysfunction from these. Finally, here's a case, a bit more of a paradigm shift. A guy who's got a complete plexus palsy from a motorbike accident, completely can't move his arm. You can guess which one. And um, normally, in order to reanimate the arm, we would try to um, move a muscle that's already working from locally, doing a tendon transfer. But he had, doesn't have anything because his pec's not working, his lat dorsi's not working, nothing around his shoulder's working. So you then either have to move a muscle with its blood supply and nerve, so then you have to wait for nerve regeneration into the muscle, and the only nerve you can move is intercostals. But what if you could expand the region of tendon and muscle transfers if you left the muscle attached with its nerve, because that's the critical bit, and then just revascularize it. And so we did some cadaver dissections, and here's a rectus muscle with the intercostal nerves. It's segmentally supplied, as you know. And you dissect the intercostal nerves up to the mid-clavicular line. And then it's pedicled nerve, but free vascular. So that's a kind of paradigm shift in how you can think about providing a functioning muscle transferred to the arm. This is a cadaver, but this is the patient here. Huge wound. There's the skin paddle with the rectus. Those are the intercostal nerves. Transferred into his arm. You just see the skin paddle here. And by tensing his abdomen, he can flex his arm to 90 degrees. It's not great. It's good for pictures, and he does use it to hold stuff against his abdomen. Um, but it's the best I can do at the moment. So that's a bit more over here, but not complete paradigm shift. So I don't have any examples of those yet. Academic surgery has looked at innovation, uh, like the ideal collaboration of Peter's and uh, Scott's parabola of how an idea is adopted and then discarded. But all of these kind of um, look at the evidence that you need to provide for a innovation to be adopted wholesale. But what about before this? The idea, the pre-I, that's the bit that needs encouragement. How do we generate ideas? Where do they come from? They come from people being presented with problems, like I showed, a frustration with the issue, like dragging your suitcase along, asking questions all the time about, is this the right way? Are the outcomes what we expect? Is there a better way of doing this? thinking in reverse, inexperience. A lot of things I discovered because I didn't read the books. I just made it up myself only to discover that that worked, but it wasn't in the books. Or whereas I'd read it first, I may not have done it. To identify patients' needs and patients' feelings about what they need. You have to question everything. The peptic ulcer thing really influenced me because, because for the... Um, Medical students and junior doctors here who don't know the story, when I was training, there was rafts of operation uh, that were designed to treat peptic ulcers because they were caused by acid. 
And then in my, inst in, I trained in Perth, Western Australia, and one of my pathology profs, Prof Harvey, noticed once on a biopsy some squiggly things. And he showed it to the gastroenterologist. The gastroenterologist um, had one of their failing trainees have a look at it, Barry Marshall. They discovered that, in fact, those squiggly things were an organism. Despite the fact that everybody knew nothing can grow in the stomach because it's too acidic, it's sterile. And so it took them 10 years to convince the rest of the world that this was the cause of ulceration for 10 years. They got a Nobel Prize, but not a billion dollars. On a plastic surgery bent, in the 60s, there was a strong and well-held belief, it was fact, that the blood supply from the skin supplied the muscle. So the blood went through the skin, then down to muscle. And so flaps and things were designed so that you could transfer muscle by taking a skin flap, not the other way around. They were 180 degrees wrong, but it was fact at that time. So you have to question everything. Every fact you know is not a fact. It's an alternative fact. Yeah. It's good to have inexperience, as I said, because if you don't know what you're doing, then you have to invent something to do it, and you're not confined by, by knowledge. Um, when I get involved with other specialties, like I have with transplant, with diabetes, I go in as a complete novice, and I ask the stupidest questions, um, which often don't have answers, or where the knowledge is incomplete, or the knowledge is then shown to be incorrect. So it's great to have an experience. I live by that. So do some others. I think it's important to challenge yourself that when faced with a problem or a new situation, you have to think about it before you go and look it up, the answer. You think about it before you go and ask somebody else. Try and come up with a solution for yourself because you are all creative. You all do this. You just, it's been beaten out of you because of the risks, because people tell you you have to do it my way. You have to do it this way. You don't. I think it's very important to have cross-fertilization. So I've learned a lot of techniques from orthopedic surgeons, transplant surgeons, diabetologists, uh, my colleagues. And there are a lot of times when I will go next door to a theater and see someone using a bit of kit or doing something that I go, ah, oh, I can use that for some patient. Or it's some little kernel in your brain that you think about next time. I love wandering around DIY hardware shops because you can look at that bit of kit and you go, wow, look at that. I could use that on a patient. So when we used to attach ligaments previously, we used to put a drill hole through, pass the stitch through, tie the stitch on the other side. And then some smart guy who went to the DIY store said, well, we could use a bone anchor like people use wall anchors. And so they patented bone anchors. It's a multi-billion dollar business. Ideas can be simple, but cross-fertilization is very important. Do you know about this activity where you're given a bunch of spaghetti, some tape, and a marshmallow, and the, the activity is that within half an hour you have to build a tower, the highest tower that can support a marshmallow at the top for five minutes wins. And so some big guys in the States did an experiment. They got some groups. At the smart end of the group, they had some MIT engineers, some architects, and what they perceived to be the dumb end of the group were some primary school kids, and then a smattering of people in between. I won't tell you where the surgeons came. So the MIT, and they had 30 minutes, right? So the MIT engineers spent 25 minutes designing, planning, setting up their structure, uh, and then five minutes building it. The kids start building straight away. They don't make a group, they don't organize, they just start building. When it doesn't work, they add bits to it, they try it, they build other things. Who got the tallest tower in the time allotted? The kids. You have to try. Don't over plan. I'm a great believer in this. It's not because I'm lazy. <laughs> not every idea works. You're going to fail. And you might fail because your idea is completely wrong, or it's the wrong idea at the wrong time, or for the wrong thing. So this is a great idea if you've got this surface. 
And you might think, this is completely crazy. Someone tells you they can make a bicycle with wonky wheels and, and that the person can ride smooth. Is that possible? It's bonkers. But it works. It's called relo polygons. So that the circumference across is the same at any point. And so the rider rides straight. I don't think it's very comfortable. So you, must, you mustn't um, be scared of failure. You've got to learn from it. Um, and celebrate it, because it means you tried, and you pick up something that you can use for either next time or to modify your thing. Edison, you know, famously did 10,000 um, attempts to get his light bulb correct. 10,000 variations of, of vacuum, light, filament, until he got the right one. I think the culture in which you work in is very important because you need a culture that promotes ideas, that encourages independent thinking, that encourages creativity, uh, that engages with that, that accepts that there is a risk with doing these things, that is, celebrates your failure and is good humoured when things go badly wrong. And um, unfortunately, not many cultures like this. Most cultures have serial killers, idea murderers. In order to survive and to do this, you need to take risks. You need to break some rules. Um, something else I'm also quite skilled at. Education. So in, um, in industry or business, they have whole departments set up and paid for for developing innovation and ideas. Have we got that in medicine? No. Some universities in the States are now developing it, so Mayo, Stanford, Harvard, now have departments of medical idea and innovation and design. And I think that we should encourage creativity and innovation in our organization. Now, we do have, um, once you've got an idea and developed it, the next phase, the commercialization, there is quite good um, skills and education about that that exist already in Oxford. But it's the bit before that. It's the bit, it's the actual idea generation and then developing the idea to the stage where you get to the next step, where there is those facilities. Education would have saved this guy, or made this guy a lot of money. So that, those people who made a billion dollars was VAC. University, 600 million. Argento Moriquas, the, the surgeon, and the scientist, 250. This was the guy from, from Kansas who they bought out with a license fee, 250. This is the Russian, right? They duped him. They paid him 350 an hour. He couldn't work enough hours to ever make this up. Bad education. Let me tell you my story, right? Because I developed a device, super simple, uh, in response to a diktat that came from MHRA that said you can't use a, a non-CE marked tourniquet for a digital tourniquet anymore. So you couldn't use a rubber glove, you couldn't use a Penrose drain, you had to use a CE marked tourniquet. And at that time there was just one which was very cumbersome, large and very expensive. So I devised this very intricate silicon rubber strip that you put on, it's just like a Penrose drain. If you sex it up, you say, well, it's got a breaking strain well below Penrose drain, so you can never exert enough pressure to make a finger ischemic, uh, uh, to cause injury to the digital nerves. Uh, it's much broader than a Penrose drain, so the pressure exerted is over a wider period. Anyway, it's all rubbish, isn't it? <laughs> so, and so having invented this, I was so embarrassed about the stupidity of this thing, which essentially is a piece of rubber which you use with a clip, that I gave it to the company. They sell 10,000 more units of this every year. It's their, their biggest selling item. I get nothing. If I'd been better educated, not so embarrassed, I'm embarrassed telling you, but not as embarrassed as I am for missing out on 10,000 pounds a year. Anyway, education would have prevented this, I think. Leadership, partnership, and friends is very important. I'm very supported by my colleagues, uh, at least I think I am. 
And so that makes it easier to innovate and to progress ideas because I can talk to them and I know they'll be receptive. And it's important that you find people who are receptive when you have ideas because there are a lot of idea murderers around, the biggest of which is yourself because you doubt that you have an idea that's worthwhile. You can come up with this really simple idea and it will, could be useful. Uh, you fear rejection, you fear failure, you fear ridicule, um, you, you fear criticism. Why are you trying something new? The existing thing already works. Uh, you, you predict already, oh, it's not going to work because... You can't have those things. You can't predict what's going to work and what isn't going to work. I would like to encourage you all to generate ideas. You have 100 billion neurons. You're all creative. You do it every day. You just need to do it more. You need to revel in it. You need to enjoy it. You need to share it. It's been beaten out of you. You've got to get it back. I like to think sometimes that, uh, as an analogy, surgeons are a bit like chefs, right? We're all trained to be cooks. So we can all follow a recipe and conclude the recipe and produce sort of what the textbook wanted. But you discover that you don't have that ingredient in your cupboard, and if you're comfortable with it, you swap ingredients. You use onion salt instead of garlic salt. I don't know, you know, something. Instead of zucchini, you use some other vegetable. But it, so that's the tinkering, the variation. And then there's those more adventurous chefs who don't use a cookbook, and they, because they've learned how to cook, they know that you know, eggs and cream go together, and so then they start being more inventive either in response to a guest who says, oh, I really want a particular dish, or, be or because they're tinkering in the kitchen and inventing stuff. And real chefs, of course, are inventing their, their whole menus, their recipes, and, and, they, and then the other cooks take their lead from that. So I want you all to be chefs, not cooks. It's good. You've got to be a good cook first, and then be a chef. But don't stay at being a cook. Finally, I'd like to thank my sponsor. Please rush out and buy my magic wound healer. No, I'm joking. Okay. Now, I said we had to celebrate uh, failure or success. So I'm going to try again to stitch a balloon. Okay? If I fail, are you going to celebrate it with me? Yeah? And if I succeed, also equally? Okay. OK, you've got to keep trying when you fail, right? Because you think this is not possible. It is possible. OK. You can stitch a balloon. Thank you. <laughs>